This study has a sector-based approach to climate change, and they look at you know the drivers of uh, of um, of global warming, and this allows policymakers to focus more specifically on those sectors. It's important because uh, they point uh, a bullseye on the way we uh, do transportation. We have to control transportation emissions, uh, and we're trying to do that. We have um, cafe standards. We have. Uh, support for new technologies, electric vehicles, uh, we're looking at low carbon fuels, but this finding says we've got to look at also at how much we drive uh, and do uh, take some actions to reduce the total demand for transportation uh, and particularly driving. The practical steps that policymakers can take is to focus directly on the need to drive everywhere. And that means fewer trips. What can we do to uh, you know, telecommute and other ways that we can uh, 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 drive less to, to get services and access friends? Um, second, shorter trips. We need to support better connection between land use planning and transportation, what the people call smart growth so that uh, the trip lengths can be reduced. Um, and third, we have to give them more choices. We have to give the public more choices. Uh, and uh, interestingly, as origins and destinations come together, you can have more choices. Public transportation makes sense. Buses make sense. Bike paths make sense. Biking and walking make sense. Uh, so uh, these are all interconnected, and public policy uh, and, and legislators need to focus on giving the public more options in the way they travel. There's actually several opportunities to address transportation and global warming in legislation presently before Congress. There's uh, an interesting opportunity because we're both considering energy and climate legislation and transportation legislation. Uh, there's an opportunity for the energy and climate legislation uh, uh, through either a carbon fee or a cap and trade uh, provision to generate enormous amounts of revenue. Uh, we also have a transportation bill that is broke, that we're funding about $20 billion a year of the transportation uh, program out of the general fund. So if we could move some of the money generated by the energy and climate bill to green transport, which also reduces carbon, and fund the transportation program, uh, you get both a deficit reduction bill, you get a funded transportation bill, you get an oil independence bill, an energy independence bill, and you get a climate protection bill. So it's, uh, it's like eating your Wheaties in the morning, you know, it, it just uh, contributes good things to everybody to link these two bills. Ordinary people, that's all of us, uh, are going to have to pay more for transportation, basically. And we might as well pay it through transportation carbon reduction. Uh, and that means some sort of carbon fee or gas tax. Now, that's a problem uh, in the short term. It's, uh, uh, we've, we've increased the gas tax three times in the last 35 years, and it's always been a fight. But it's, uh, it's been uh, increased basically on the argument of deficit reduction and investments in better transportation systems. The public, if they think they're getting something for their money, will pay for uh, a better outcome, a better community, uh, and a better transportation system. It is true that uh, the public resists increases in gas taxes. And uh, the reason why is because they're not thinking they're getting a return on their investment. Um, uh, and an irony is that even though gas taxes are low compared to other countries uh, in the world, in the United States, our total household costs of transportation are high. The, uh, the average amount of uh, household budget spent on transportation in the United States is about 19%, which is higher than our health care costs, which are about 16%. And the reason is that is we only we, we have few transportation choices. We have to drive everywhere to do anything. And so for every licensed driver, there has to be another car. Uh, if we had more choices then and did not have to invest in uh, so many vehicles, if we had 
you know, transit and biking and walking, and people didn't live so far apart from uh, their jobs, um, uh, household expenses would go down as, uh, uh, as gas taxes actually go up to invest in a green transport system. The United States uh, consumes 25 percent of the world's uh, petroleum right now, and that's primarily because of the way we travel. Uh, um, Seventy percent of oil consumption in the United States is transportation, and that is uh, because we're spread out, we drive everywhere, uh, and uh, we have you know, over 700 cars per thousand population in order to support our driving habits. The rest of the world uh, is much less dependent on cars and much more efficient consumers of petroleum. Uh, if we don't uh, adopt measures that reduce our need to travel for our own benefit, we can't expect the rest of the world not to behave in the same way. So uh, by addressing the way we travel by helping ourselves, by giving ourselves more transportation choices, by connecting transportation to land use development, so more compact. We're not only helping ourselves, but we're providing a model for the rest of the world of how they can develop in a way that's sustainable and low carbon and, uh, uh, and more choices for everybody. If uh, the United States passed a transportation bill that priced transportation carbon, uh, and that was linked to an energy and climate bill that would reinvest the, the resources, the revenues of such a price into a green transportation system, the United States would be on track to meet its stated obligation or stated goal of a 17 to 20 percent absolute decrease in carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. Uh, that would give comfort to other countries, particularly China, India, the other countries that are emerging economies, that the United States is serious about reducing its transportation carbon and it would contribute to the likelihood of a global climate agreement.